Good morning, First Baptist Church, Denver. This is Sunday School, and today we're in the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 12, verses 1 through 15. And the lesson is called Nathan Condemns David. But before we get started, you know, I'd like to share something with you. You know, Super Bowl is coming up next week. And everybody has their favorite team. So let me tell you about Bob. Bob won a ticket to the Super Bowl on a local radio station. And on game day, he loaded up his gear, drove to the stadium, found his seat, and of course, it was way up in the nosebleed section. A couple minutes into the first quarter, Bob was scanning the, the uh, stands, and he noticed with his binoculars that there was an empty seat right on the 50-yard line and there was an open seat there. Every couple plays, Bob would check out that seat. It was still vacant. Shortly before halftime, Bob decided he was going to go down to that seat at halftime and find out if he could claim it. So the seat stayed open. Bob made his way down and asked the gentleman next to the seat if it was taken. The man replied, the seat was supposed to be for my wife. We haven't missed the Super Bowl in 30 years. Sadly, she has just passed away, and it may be difficult because he was embarrassed, and he was very sorry to hear that. I'm sure it must be very, very difficult for you coming to the Super Bowl alone for the first time in 30 years, but these are the best two seats in the stadium. Couldn't you find any friends or relatives to come to the game with you? After all, the Super Bowl, the man replied and said, that all are at her funeral. Amen. All right. So let's look at this lesson in 2 Samuel 12. The key verse is, Nathan said to David, thou art the man, in 2 Samuel 12, 7. Let's just have a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you right now for all that you're going to do in this lesson today. Allow us and we, can and we can appreciate you keeping us during this pandemic. And we pray your word will go forth. Help us to focus more on you as we should. It is in you that we cherish. In your son's name, Jesus, amen. There's a word I like to use called undercover. Undercover. Sometimes we just think we can get away with anything. But God does see all things, and he can do all things. Nothing we do or even think internally can escape God. We can try to hide things, but God sees all. We may feel bad, we may feel shame, or we may feel worthless, or what we have done to another, but God is there for us. All we have to do is call on him. Call his name, seek him out, seek his face, and have him comfort us. The public, however, can be cruel, very cruel, even in God's word. When you were guilty in the eyes of men, <clears throat> what did they do? They stoned you to death. I'm glad that doesn't happen today, but there are other ways to make someone reach their demise. <clears throat> and you find that in John 10, 31, in Acts 7, 59. So are you a rock thrower, I ask? Are you the one that's guilty? Are you a victim, or are you both? We who love the Lord know that what is done in the dark <clears throat> will one day come to light. And so in this lesson, we're going to discuss the sins and the consequences that extend beyond us and can hurt so many others. We will discuss the sin of David, and its consequences, and admit our sins while seeking God's forgiveness. Now, there was the in focus story before we get into the lesson to talk about Carlton, who was a young man of eight years old, and he was his mama's pride and joy. He was a good student, he made good grades, he had the best behavior, and was often the center of attention at school. He had plenty of friends now that his siblings had moved out. One day, Carlton was goofing around.
around in the living room and broke his mama's favorite vase. The vase was unique in design, <clears throat> and he was able to put the pieces together and place them up against the lamp so that it appeared to be in one piece. He did not tell his mom, and you know what's going to happen. Months later, while doing his homework, he heard his mama scream, Carlton! Carlton, it was in that moment that he remembered it was now time to face the truth. Sometimes, people, we have to allow grace, but we still have to face the truth. Amen. So let's look at the lesson. The first part in 2 Samuel is in chapter 12, verses 1 through 7. Verse 1. And the Lord sent Nathan unto David, and he came unto him and said unto him, there were two men in one city, one rich and the other poor. Now, after the birth of Bathsheba's son, the Lord would send Nathan, the Lord sends Nathan to David. Nathan is a prophet of God who previously delivered a message to David, which was very familiar. He had a covenant relationship with David and his descendants in 2 Samuel 7 and in 1 Chronicles 17, 1 through 15. As we know, David was raised as a shepherd boy who tended his sheep, and his sheep represents God's people. And David loved his sheep just as God loves his people. We are his sheep. Now, at some point, David found himself lusting after Bathsheba. She was the wife of Uriah. And after David impregnated her, he was determined to have her for his wife. Now men, I'm talking to you right now. We have to learn to be satisfied with the wife we have chosen and not lust over another. David had many wives as king, but he lusted for Bathsheba. David thereafter set up a series of events to have Bathsheba's husband, whose name was Uriah, killed. But first, he encouraged Uriah, who was in his military, who was in the military for David, to go home and sleep with his wife Bathsheba. He refused. Then David notified the general to have Uriah sent to the front line of battle. And there he was killed. This is just to let us know that no matter what's done in the dark will one day come to light. No one wanted to or desired to challenge the king. King David thought he could do anything and escape the consequences. Because why? He was the king. We however know that no matter your title, if you are king, if you are president, or if you are an Indian chief, no one can escape the consequences of sin. We cannot hide our actions from God. This reminds me of a song that my mother liked long ago by Nancy Wilson. It talks about when she saw something that she saw one day. That's what it was. Something that she saw one day. And <clears throat> it starts out saying that, guess who I saw today, my dear? I went into town to shop and thought I stopped for a bite. I saw two people at a bar who were so in love. Then I realized who I saw. I headed out blindly out the door. They didn't see me passing through. So when he got home, she asked him, guess who I saw today, my dear? And it ended up being him. Amen? So we just have to always know that we're always being watched by our Heavenly Father. Amen. So God sends Nathan, the prophet, 
who shared the story with King David about two men, one rich and one poor. David had been a naughty king, naughty, bad, and God had to teach him a lesson. David had been unchallenged for his previous actions. David started a little by little until he was overtaken in sin and injustice. Like most people in a high position, like that king, well, David thought that he could just do it and get away with it without challenge. We may hide our sin from humans and, or, and shield ourselves in injustice, but we can't do that with God. He sees all, he knows all, and nothing can be, can be hidden from our God. Now when we look at verses 2 and 3, in the story of the is the story of two men, one rich and had many flocks, many sheep, many herds, and one was poor. And the one that was poor only had one little lamb. And he treated that lamb like it was one of the family. The children raised the lamb with him. They fed the lamb while the lamb grew up with the family. Then we have the rich man. Right? The rich man who had exceedingly numbers of flocks and herds. Now this naughty king and this God had to teach him a lesson. So, the rich, verse 2 says, the rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds. That is just an overwhelming amount. And verse 3 says, the poor man had absolutely nothing. Now, all this time, King David is clueless, clueless that the rich man discussed in this story was about him. The U, the E-W-E, is a female sheep or lamb. Nathan continues in verse 4. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress for wearing man that was to come unto him, but took the poor man's land and dressed it, got it prepared for dinner for the man that was about to come to him. Now here we have this rich man, and in spite of having everything you can imagine, he takes or he steals the poor man's sheep to entertain his guests. Poor man had just that one lamb, treated the lamb like a child, stayed in the house with the family and his children. It was common practice to entertain strangers back in the day in the Old Testament. You'll find that in Hebrews 13, 2, where it says, Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some may have entertained angels unaware. When we look at verses 5 and 6, David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man has done this thing, shall surely die. David doesn't know he's talking about himself. Huh? And he shall restore the lamb fourfold, because this is the thing, and because he had no pity. See, David is really upset now. He is angry toward this rich man. And as the king, he was obligated to provide justice. Justice for all. For the poor man. And his, he says death is the penalty. He's pronouncing the death penalty for this <clears throat> uh, injustice. He swears this wicked man must surely die. He goes on to say that the poor man should be restored fourfold. So if he had one lamb, he should get four. This restitution is to be with four lambs. And his life is required, saying in part, the man shall surely die. The Old Testament does not allow for death penalty for theft, but does for kidnapping in Exodus 21.16. But David thought his act was worthy of the death sentence because this man had no pity. 
He had no compassion. It's interesting to note also that things have not changed or improved since the biblical times very much. The statement, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer, is very much alive today. Injustice is still common occurrence. It's still going on. The rich is stealing from the poor. It's still a common phenomenon in our society. The rich still extort the poor and the needy. <clears throat> and people in positions of authority use their office and position to steal from those who are less rich or who are poor. And they are even celibate. There is nothing in injustice because it is all over the world. Now King David has everything just thrown right back into his face when Nathan spoke. I would have found a hole to dig and just jump in that hole for what I hear next. Nathan said to David, thou art the man. It's you. David said, Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel. I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. I gave thee thy master's house. I gave thee thy master's wives unto thy bosom and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have given you more has given you more unto such things, such and such. Here we have God is speaking a word. I anointed you king over Israel. I delivered you from Saul. I gave thee my master's house and thy master's wives. I gave thee house of Israel and of Judah and would do more if that was not enough. Enough. I will give you such and such, he goes on to say. And that's basically whatever else you requested. Therefore, it doesn't make sense to steal and murder in order to cover sin. Why are we never satisfied, people? Why? Why are we never satisfied? Why is it so hard to judge ourselves? Why? The rich want to be richer? The poor have to prove their worth. Injustice still exists. The rich take. There's an article I was reading last week about a story in New York where the rich were taking the poor people's property fast as they could take it. Now we look at verses 9 and 10. It reads, Wherefore thou hast despised the commandment of the Lord, to do evil in his sight. Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. That's Bathsheba's husband. And hast taken his wife to be thy wife. And hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now, in verse 10, Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thy house, because thou hast, God says, despised me. Despised me. That's one thing we don't want to do ever to God. Despise him. And has taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. David simply is guilty of all charges. After stating his case, the Lord asked David a conscious, piercing question. And that question is, why? Wherefore, why hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord? to do evil in his sight. There are consequences when we sin, people. Are we guilty of sin? We all are guilty of sin. Why? Why did the devil? Did the devil make you do it? Have you forgotten the goodness of the Lord? Do you disregard the commandment of the Lord? These same sins Saul committed, and the Lord took his kingdom from him. In 1 Samuel 13, 14, it reads, But now thy kingdom shall not continue. This is God talking to Saul. The Lord has sought him, a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him 
to be captain over his people because, because, David confesses. So many will not confess. Release me from the verdict of death, God. This should be hardened believers. We have to be hardened believers who continue to struggle against sin. Confession allows the heart to once again be fully devoted to the Lord. Confession was the very first step on the path of forgiveness for David and for us. And I'll just say that again. And for us. We have to confess our sins to the Lord. In Leviticus 20.10, if a man commits adultery with another man's wife, with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress must be put to death. Both of them. We don't have, we don't follow that law today. But that's God's word. David must bear the consequences of his actions. However, now Nathan departed unto his house, in verse 15, and the Lord struck the child of Uriah's wife there unto David, and it was very sick. And as the word said, the baby died. Although David is totally forgiven, he still has to bear the consequences for his actions. Therefore, his firstborn, the son of David and Bathsheba, shall die. Nathan pronounces, we encounter the essence of God's nature and attributes. He is gracious. God is merciful. Yet, he is still a righteous and just God. He executes justice and equity to all people irrespective of who they are, the position they hold, or they, what they may occupy. And all these things that are going on right now in our world today, celebrities being put on blast, politicians being put on blast for things they've done and having to resign or being put in jail, just goes to show you that not very much has changed. We who love the Lord have to love him totally. That's 100%. Amen? Amen. So in conclusion, no matter what our situation, we should praise the Lord and his many blessings in our lives. When we look back over our lives, he has done great things. God has promised he will never leave us. He will never forsake us. For we are in his presence for all eternity. If celebrating the Lord's greatness will not give you joy and peace during the storms of life, we ask the question, what will? One day we must all stand before the Lord in the judgment seat of Christ. He will judge us for even the act we may think we have gotten away from. On that great day, there will be no excuses. So to prepare us, God sends his spirit to lead people to help us see the sins in our present lives. When he sees our sin, we should boldly acknowledge it and confess it to God. Indeed, God has provided a path for us in Jesus Christ that we are able to walk in confidence, in confidence in this world. So just think about that. How do you respond when God sends you a Nathan to talk about your sin in your life? Just remember that God is all of our God. We just have to follow him and follow his word. Let's have a word of prayer. Oh Lord, our God, in all circumstances, we can praise you. You, for we are your children. Oh Lord, please help us to recognize that nothing can be done without you that you are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. You know all things, and we pray this in your Son Jesus' name. Amen. And before we go, we'd like to open up just to let you know that you do have an opportunity to accept the Lord if you have not done so. I call it the ABCs. First, you have to admit your sin. 
First, you, second, you have to believe in who the Lord is. And third, you need to confess to the Lord. And you can find all, all these things right in Romans 10, verses 9 through 10. But the main thing is find a Bible-based church so that you can get some, what I call, education in the Word. Amen? This is Brother George Tillerson signing off. Y'all have a great rest of the day. Amen. Peace unto you.